thank you all for once again joining us here on Doc's House Calls. Today is going to be fantastic because um, we've got a longtime friend of mine, Chip Yuen, founder of AVIG in the Netherlands. And uh, as I've said many times, for my money, the best designer in the business. So we're happy to have him here. Chip, thanks for joining. Yeah. How are you today? Here. Finally. Yeah. I've, uh, I've wanted to have you on the show for a long time, but like I said, because people do, uh, people that follow us online know that you and I are friends. I didn't want to start out with, uh, with you and with Sue Jane and people go like, Oh God, like these three guys again. Mm -hmm. Um, but, and I also knew that you had some models coming up and, and I thought we would want to talk about those. And I wanted to make sure that the timing was right for your business as well. Yeah. So do you want to start out? Telling the story, I guess we'll tell each of our versions of how you and I first became friendly. Um, yeah, I was a collector uh, of mainly vintage Seikos and, and stuff like that. Um, obscure uh, 70s uh, watches. And I went to Watch You Seek, Watch Forum, and... Um, never left after I started researching uh, some stuff. Um, for a couple of years, I was just a co collector. And then uh, one day I saw something uh, in a sub forum for um, a watch project. And I decided to, uh, to yeah, the, a, a few drawings. And, um, if, if, so about what year was this? Because this is before I joined the forums. Um, 2011, 2012? When I became a member, I can't recall. I think it must have been uh, in, the, in the early days. So yeah. like before 2010? Have you been a member that long? Yeah. Really? I was, I think I was still um, at the academy or uh, in, 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 in school. How long ago was this? Uh, close to 20 years, I think. I don't know wow. how long What You Seek uh, exists, but... Okay, so you've been, a, you've been a member even longer than I realized. Um, so... I'm gonna look, I'm gonna look up your profile real quick just to verify this and make sure I'm not crazy. Oh, okay, I don't remember. Wow, that, maybe. You, no, you're serious. You joined the yeah. forum in 2007, so you've been over. You've been a member of the forum for over 20 years now. Yeah. So you well, really are like well, an OG, original gangster. 12, there. 12 years. No, uh, right. Okay. Wow. Okay. Uh, I got my math uh, right. All right. Yeah. I, I said but, uh, maybe I was there. <laughs> or uh, I, I joined that year, but maybe I, I, I was just lurking uh, for a couple of years before that. All right, so let's, I'm gonna speed this up a little bit. So I remember when I joined the forums, I was thinking about making a watch. I was gonna use a Chinese movement. I ended up uh, spending some time in the Chinese mechanical watches sub forum, basically as research into Chinese movements. And that's where I stumbled across these series of project watches for the guys in that sub forum, always being organized by our friend Hong Kong Ed. And routinely, you were the guy who was illustrating all of these projects. So then by the time I became kind of a, a regular in the affordable sub forum, I ended up on the committee to steer the project watch that was being done for the affordable sub watches, for, uh, affordable watches sub forum. And you were just sort of like our automatic choice because we already had Hong Kong Ed involved. Um, everybody knew you from your many fantastic illustrations that you did for the Chinese Mac watch sub forum. And so you, you are our kind of default choice and you of course stepped up and, and agreed to do all that. And all these jobs that you were doing were completely without compensation. I mean, you, you would get a watch maybe from the project, but that was it. Right. Mm -hmm. So 
this is the part where I think it starts to get funny. So I finished my first watch and then we were working on, I was working on the second watch, but I had all these different ideas and I wasn't really sure which ones went together. And I realized I stink at illustration. Like I, I have, I think good design ideas, but I don't know how to get them down and actually draw them. I knew you, you were great at it. So I came to you and I said, Hey, I would like your help doing design. And you were basically like, yeah, screw you. I'm not doing that. I'm getting ready to start my own business. Yeah, yeah. It was around the, the same time, uh, indeed. Uh, I did two, no, three, actually, uh, projects with uh, Ed, but only one got made. Mm -hmm. that. Um, and then uh, you came along with the Affordables uh, Dive Watch. The Flying Dutchman. Yeah, which I did. So I had four uh, watch designs plus all the collateral that I uh, created out of that. And um, Which you created not just the designs for the project, but a lot of your designs for those projects that did not get made became the basis for your company AVIC. Where a lot of those, exactly. a lot of those early illustrations became the Balor or the Valkyr or the you know uh, the Corvid. Is that right? Yeah, the Corvid and the Huldra. Uh, those were the two first designs that I uh, made for Avic and the Balor, the dual crown. That was one of the uh, Chinese um, um, subform watch designs I had in mind. Uh, which didn't make it by just one vote. <laughs> You're um, not bitter about it. No, 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 no. Uh, and then years later, uh, that became my third, my no, my fourth model after the Valkyrie. And uh, for the better, because by then I learned a lot more about the industry and uh, capabilities of uh, manufacturers and, and stuff like that. So, um, yeah. All right, so I'm going, to, I'm going to backtrack a little bit. For anybody watching this who's a native speaker, they may detect that you've got a bit of an accent. So you are raised in the Netherlands, so obviously you speak fluent Dutch, but your parents are from uh, southern China, so they spoke Cantonese around the house. So you actually grew up speaking Cantonese as well. Yeah, I only learned... Uh, Dutch when I went to uh, kindergarten. Oh, so you you were you, you started out speaking Cantonese and then you learned Dutch starting from preschool. Yeah, from uh, <coughs> five, age of five. So English is actually your third language. Yes. All right. So anybody that doesn't think you speak very good English should try their hand at Dutch and Cantonese. <laughs> well, here in in the Netherlands. Uh, English is uh, compulsory on uh, in high school, and then we also had a couple of years of German and French as well. So you speak so, German and French as well? Well, we speak German uh, pretty well. Uh, French not so good anymore, but uh, I do or, or can make myself uh, understood. Yeah, All right. Speak French, yes. So the. <laughs> The way that you and I have gotten along so well, because I'm a bit of a talker, is that you barely say anything when we're hanging around. Like We have to pull stuff out of you. But when you do start talking, it's like you're just dropping bombs nonstop. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. You mean? No, I, okay. Yeah, we're, we're going we're gonna to play it that way. Fine. Okay. Um, so this was 2013 when we were working on the uh, project together, the, for, the affordable sub, sub, uh, sub forum, affordable watches sub forum project, the Flying Dutchman. That was also about the time that I was wrapping up my first watch, the Ricardo, working on my second watch. You told me you were thinking about starting your own business. And I was like, okay, you know, what can I do to help? Nice guy, we got along. And, you know, at that time I had, just started to become friendly with Sue Jane as well from Melbourne Watch Company. And the three of us kind of quickly became the three amigos, not just because we got along as friends, but 
it was an, it, we, I think we all saw the advantage in having a small group of guys that were all going through the same things with their business at the same time. So we were all trying to find vendors, figuring out production, figuring out timelines, order management, order delivery, websites, marketing, all of that stuff we were working on together. And so those early days that I would say that first year that we were all starting our business together, you, me, and Sujin, it was almost like every night we'd be by email or by Skype texting back and forth. Like, have you tried this? What do you think about that? Do you remember like back in those days, what you think was like the biggest challenge for you getting your business off the ground? Um, I think all the technical terms or manufacturing um, lingo, I guess, and, um, and the ways to communicate mainly. Uh, communicate with the vendors. Yeah, because a lot of them or most of them speak only Mandarin and I only speak Cantonese. So uh, that didn't help. Right. And, and you don't, and in, in you don't, you, you can't read or write Cantonese. So just again, we'll, we'll backtrack. Man, Mandarin and Cantonese are both dialects of Chinese and written, they're both the same. So if you can read and write, it doesn't matter if you speak Cantonese or Mandarin, the written language is the same. But if you can't read or write the characters, being able to speak Cantonese doesn't help you if the other person is speaking Mandarin. No. Um, but yes, I, I, I don't uh, read or write uh, Chinese, but uh, Cantonese is also a uh, grammar-wise, it's totally different from official uh, written Chinese. And uh, so in, in that respect, I also do not follow. Uh, if someone, uh, somebody reads a book to me in Cantonese, I think 60% of that I will, I do not understand. Because, because the, the language has evolved beyond sort of traditional grammar rules of Chinese. Yeah. Can you hear that, by the way? I just turned a fan on. It's hot in here. No. Can you, hear, you can't hear the fan on? Okay, good. No. Um, all right. So you're in the Netherlands starting your business. You speak English, okay, Dutch very well, Cantonese pretty well. You, you think you're not fluent, but I've heard you speak Cantonese, and you sound pretty fluent to me. But none of that really works 100% when the vendors – in mainland China that we were working with all spoke Mandarin and their English isn't great. So even if your English was fantastic, theirs isn't. So, you know, there was a real language barrier that you had to overcome dealing with all these guys in China. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, and I had to do it too, because again, like I, I don't speak Mandarin, Dutch or Cantonese and, you know, don't even ask me to go to German or French. So we were, I think, again, all of us trying to figure out, how do we all get onto the same page with our vendors? Uh, because at that time we were all working with vendors directly on the mainland. They all spoke mm -hmm. Mandarin. You couldn't even jump on the phone and, and, and talk and speak Cantonese to them. No. Nope. So fast forward to 2014, you, me, Su Jane, we had all been in business uh, about a year, maybe a little bit more at that point. And we had all kind of reached the same breaking point of frustrations with the process, delays in production, changes to our designs that we didn't authorize and didn't know about until we got them out of prototyping or out of production, um, constantly blowing past deadlines, quality control issues. I mean, it was just, it was making us all nuts and we all had the same complaints. So we all go to the Hong Kong show and I think we talked about this in those threads that we were doing on the forum when we talked about our travels around Hong Kong and then into mainland China, because we, we made the point to go into mainland China. We spent two days touring vendors' facilities, meeting with our primary vendor to kind of 
have almost like what I call a come to Jesus meeting. Like, you know, we need to straighten some things out here. So it's you, me, and Sue Jane sitting on one side of the table, and then the other guys on the other side, but they all speak Mandarin. There's like one guy there who speaks Cantonese. And then I think there was a, a young lady there who her English was amazingly good. And I think, did she speak Cantonese as well or she just spoke really good English? Do you remember? Uh, I think she only spoke English. Uh, okay, so yeah. the, the guy we dealt with only spoke Mandarin and some English. The owner of the factory didn't speak any English at all. There was one guy there from engineering that spoke Cantonese and Mandarin. And then we had this young lady who spoke Mandarin and pretty good English. So that was like the party, right? So we're all basically <laughs> not shouting, but arguing back and forth across the table. And you, me, and Sue Jane are on one side kind of doing this like in English. And then you're trying to translate it into Cantonese for the guy on the other side while I'm trying to get the girl who speaks English to translate it into a man Mandarin while he's trying to translate the Mandarin. It was like yeah. a round robin there. Fun times. Yeah, and <laughs> that, that meeting, I, we went drinking after that, I remember. Um, so. <laughs> yeah, but the, um, the problems remain and uh, or the problems uh, came out of um, language barriers, mainly, and... Um, yeah, I, I think a lot of it was language of us, barrier. Yeah, What's that? of us got fed up by that, and uh, we found, uh, at the fair, uh, found uh, new vendors and new manufacturers who understood better and uh, had better uh, facilities. And, um, and you move on. Right. So I, I agree with you. I think a lot of it was a language barrier, but also we needed to improve the vendors we were working with and work with better vendors, ones that were better, able to source better components, better quality, those who were able to understand our businesses and desires better. Um, I think the fact that we were working with a salesperson at that factory instead of the factory owner made a difference um and i also just think it was a cultural thing that we needed to learn about chinese business culture and you know their propensity or, or habit of saying yes to everything oh sure we can deliver that we can do it in 60 days when reality is you've never done it before maybe and you can't do it in 60 days it'll take at least 120 yeah. and you better, you better tell me 150 because you're going to blow past 120 anyway so that was a learning process for us and i look back now and i wonder if we had known then what we know now would we have been a bit less frustrated with those vendors just simply understanding that the numbers they were giving us were the numbers they thought we wanted to hear not necessarily the numbers they thought were right yeah, uh, for sure. Um, they, 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 any manufacturer or supplier will say, yes, we can do that. Uh, and they will show you something uh, of a different quality. And then, well, this, this is not what I, what, uh, what we discussed, you know, no, but this is, we can do this in, in what you want. And, uh, okay. Yeah. How does that work? Um, so we know now, but uh, you have to look past uh, what they offer, but more look into what they are willing or can do. Um, yeah. Yeah. In, in the, for real. That, that became one of my new things is every time I said, can you do this? And they said, yes, I would say, have you done it before? How many times have you done it before? What were the results? Let me see them. Point to something I can look at as an example of, you've done this, but you've also done it well. You do it all the time. Whenever they started to talk about, well, sure, maybe we could do this, maybe we could do that. I go, I, I don't want to deal in maybes. Mm -hmm. so, let's kind of go over some of what's going on in your business because there were more than once I felt like my heart was breaking for you, watching some of the things that you were dealing with. 
I think of all of us, you, me, Sue, Jane, but also, you know, kind of our extended network of micro brand owner friends, you just seem to have uh, bad luck, maybe isn't the right word, but, you know, you, you tend to find, uh, it's almost like you're the test dummy for the rest of us. All the problems any of us could have, you're like the first one to have. So I remember you made, I don't know if this is the correct order. Did you, you made the Corvid before the Holdra, correct? Uh, simultaneously. Okay. So first off, before you decided to work with the factory that we were working with, you also tried out a couple of different possible uh, possibilities, possible vendors. So one of those was Seagull, which you didn't know at the time, you thought you were dealing with the main Seagull factory in China, but they were actually having you deal with Seagull USA, which is like a separate business and run by different people and not necessarily ethical entirely. So we'll, we'll get to that, but I, I wanna try to do this in the order of you discovering the problem. So I think the first problem you found was that the quartz Corvid, the hands were, first, I think the loom didn't match on the hands. And then when you got that straightened out, like the hands were too long and like either they were scraping the inside of the crystal and the watch was slowing down or the, the movement didn't have enough torque to turn the hands. Is that right? Do I have that right? That's part, part of the issue. Yeah. Um... Indeed, the, uh, at, at first the, the loom was uh, incorrect, so the, comp the, um, the handset had to be redone to match the dials or the other way around. I don't even remember. But they sent you the watches with the wrong loom, right? Yeah. Like did they, they sent them to you with the wrong loom and then you had to send them back. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that was a problem and then you find out that the movement didn't have it. Was it the was it the hands were scraping inside of the crystal because they didn't proof the hands, or was it the torque and the movement, or both? Um, the engineering wasn't uh, one hundred percent. the The case was actually uh, a little bit too thin for all the 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 hand stack and uh, the they didn't have the clearance yeah so uh what i found out or what we found out was that the uh, when the case back was turned um, too tight it would press right the, the movement up and um, yeah all right so that's already a bad start that was your first model and like engineering that's what they do like that's the thing that a lot that most of us especially in startup we can't do that we don't know mm -hmm. how tall the movement is and how much clearance you need above the hands post and at the tip of the seconds hand and where the crystal is going to sit like that's their job their case, yeah. their case mm -hmm. they have case factory engineers yeah and that's uh, when you get the uh, uh, the loss in translation bit if you uh, specify i want the watch to be uh, 8.5 millimeter thick and uh, with the, this crystal or that crystal and they say yeah, yeah we can do that no problem and so that was they, you were going to use an acrylic crystal but then they gave you a mineral crystal um yes i First, wanted to have a, uh, a, a domed acrylic, uh, indeed, for a vintage pipe, and that became a dome, single domed um, uh, mineral. They just they just changed that on you without talking to you about it. Yeah, and so the, the flat min uh, single dome mineral, <laughs> of course, is uh, flat on the other side, and uh, uh, so you wanted a double domed acrylic because that's really like the vintage thing, double domed acrylic for a good distortion. Um, and it has that sort of softer, warmer feel. They give you a single domed mineral. So it's domed on the top, flat on the side, which yeah. is part of the reason why they didn't have the clearance inside the case, the underside of the crystal was flat. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's a lot of problems to have on one watch. And you would, so this is something I talk about with other micro brand owners and, and try to get people to understand is that 
the way our process works, typically, we come up with a design, we send that to the factory, they figure out what they are going to charge us to make it, and then we figure out how we're going to price that to sell to customers, but then we sort of back off that price to do the pre-order at a discount that attracts customers to buy it so that we can take their money and finance it, but they have to have enough of a discount to justify the wait because they're going to be waiting. We tell them two or three months, more like four to six months because that's, we didn't know any better at the time. So then when the factory, some of them just change the price in the middle of production. Um, and that just happens sometimes. It's not a good thing when they do it. Thankfully, they don't do that a lot. But I don't see it as much because I'm dealing with American dollars and they price everything in dollars. But if you are outside of America, your cost can change because of currency fluctuations. So you're dealing with that. And then if you have massive problems coming out of production and you have the additional costs of having to send everything back to China to have the hands reloomed or the hands redone or the crystal redone, or if the product isn't the way you spec'd it and sold it, that really causes problems because now the customers are waiting longer. They're canceling pre-orders. They're telling you, never mind, give me back my money. That isn't what, that isn't what I wanted or what I bought. I don't want the mineral crystal. So you, you basically made no money on that first pro You, I wouldn't be surprised. Or did you lose money on that first project? Uh, no, uh, but I did. Uh, I made a second batch, and uh, that that went well. Uh, the second they, batch went well. Yeah, they they uh, changed uh, a bit in the casing and, and and stuff like that. But, uh, but that first batch was a nightmare. The mineral crystal stayed. What's that? Uh, yeah. The mineral crystal stayed. Mm -hmm. But that first batch was a nightmare, and that was your first shot out of the gate. So again, like Sujay and I are looking at this like. Oh my yeah. God! Like what? How do we fix this? Yeah, and in the about around the same time, because I had the uh, the quartz corvette and the Holdra diver. Uh, so that had its own problems. Yeah, uh, and that one had bezel problems. Bezel I remember. Problems. So you made this. So at the same time, you're making the quartz corvette field watch. You're making the diver called the Holdra, which I think everybody agrees it's a gorgeous design. It's a turtle shaped case, very, you know, perfect size. You just really, the Corvid on its own showed what a good designer you were. But the Holdra took it, I think, to another level with the way you shaped the indices to match the shape of your logo, the, uh, the colors you chose, the shape of the case was phenomenal. The matching of the bracelet. I mean, your concept was fantastic, but that didn't really make it into reality. Yeah, uh, because uh, the, the prototype, there were some issues and th which the manufacturer would address uh, for production. And that's what they tell you. So the, the prototype is not great, but we'll fix it in production. That's typical. Mm -hmm. So uh, a couple of months later, the batch comes in, 300 pieces, and about 50%, the, the bezel was not okay. No good. No. And so I had to ship them back. Had them redo uh, the bezel, uh, which took two to three months more. Customers are waiting. You got to explain what's going on. And this is now your second watch that's like had major delays because of big problems. It doesn't, you're not off to a good start. It doesn't look good at this point. No. Um, but fortunately, customers. Uh, were, were kind enough to, to wait. And then uh, after two, three months, the watches came back. Uh, and uh, again, about 40% what came, uh, that came back uh, had other issues. Um, this is something, again, like when it comes to quality control, 
you can ask your factory to send you a picture of the dial or the bezel before they put everything together. You can ask them to send you a picture of how the case and the bracelet and the end link fit together. But you can't get a picture of how a bezel feels. They're not going to show you that there's bounce up and down on the bezel and that it's all, it's got tons of slop in it. Like you, that is something you can't figure out until you get the product in your hands. And if you're overseas, what do you do? So, you know, like I know, I was talking with Kyle from Stratton. He actually flies to the factory to do quality control there before they ship him the product. So he, had, he does everything at the factory himself. But when you're just starting your business and you know, you've got a regular daytime job and you've got bills to pay and you don't have a lot of money, especially when you've got the problems that David was having up front, you can't just jump on a plane and fly to China to do quality control because especially when they, you don't even know when, when they're gonna be ready for you to come in and do it. Like you gotta book your flights way in advance to get any kind of decent rate. So you're not just gonna jump on a plane on a whim and, and, and fly to China to do quality control. No, no. Uh, of course, you just trust your, your vendor, your manufacturer, and after seeing uh, the, the prototyping, uh, you think, okay, we can work with this, but this and that needs to be changed. And uh, you either wait three to four months uh, for a new prototype, or you just trust them that they will fix it in, in production. And every time, every time there's a problem and they say, we'll fix it in production, then the next time there's a problem, you go, all right, well, the last time they fixed it in production, or if they didn't, you think, all right, they're not gonna do this, they're not gonna make the same mistake again. And then they do, or they, or they, they, they fixed it the first time, but the second you know, product or model, they don't fix it. And it's like, what, why are we not communicating? So that's part of why we went to China to, to see them, not just to see them, but also to show them we're here looking for other vendors. If you guys can't fix these problems, we'll switch, which, you know, we, we ended up switching all of us. We went with different vendors. Um, I remember that problem you had with the Holger's bezel. I was looking at making the orthos at the time, which was going to be my first real diver with a rotating external bezel. And because of the problems you were having, I was really on top of them in the prototyping stage with the orthos. And I said, you know, send me the prototypes, but make sure that that bezel action is, you know, nice and, and tight and smooth, doesn't have the, the slop or the, the up and down bounce that the holder had. And sure enough, the prototypes were terrible. They even got like the dial color wrong. So, you know, when we were in China visiting them, that was the first time I saw the improved case, but they had trays upon trays of the orthos case already made. They never sent me the, 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 the second round of prototypes. They just went ahead and made the cases, but I guess I was paying for it. Thank God the cases were actually good. The bezel was, was the right way. Um, but then, you know, one of the things we cover in our meeting with them is look, how long does it take to do 300 or 500 pieces in production? Is it 60 days, 90 days, 120 days? Just tell us so we know, so we're not always blowing past our deadline. They go, 90 days, 90 days, 90 days. And then of course, mm -hmm. we, leave, we leave China, we come back home, I wire funds to start the work those mass production, which they'd already started anyway, thinking we're gonna have it done in 90 days. And then 120 days later, we're finally getting the ortho. So I was done at that point. All right. So you made the Corvid. You made the Huldra. You had all these problems in both. You did, the dial on the Huldra wasn't quite what you were expecting it to be, but you rolled with that. I thought it actually worked out well with that little bit of reflective surface to it. But then, and I, I think I'm getting the order of events right. This is when you discover that Seagull USA, who you had sent your designs for the Corvid and the Bilar, at least. I don't even know. Did you already? Did you also send them the Holdra to, to look at? No. Okay. So you sent them your designs for the Corvid and what was going to be your next model, the Bilar, that internal compressor style, internal bezel, 
case. Um, yeah, when we started, my dog was walking around in the background. Um, so then we find out because you decided, so they had sent you pictures, not even an actual prototype. They had sent you pictures mm -hmm. of the prototype they had made for the Bilar, and it was terrible. So by that point, you said, okay, no thanks, but no thanks. We're not going to work together. I'm going to work with this other factory, the ones we were working with. They turn around, they take your design, and they put it into production with the Seagull logo on it, and they mm -hmm. sold it like in the Philippines or Indonesia. It was like a, a, it was like a regional market model that they made. But this was not Seagull, the main mothership in China. This was Seagull USA set, making the product from China, mm -hmm. coordinated out of America, selling it in, again, was it Indonesia or Philippines, somewhere in the South Pacific? Indonesia, I think, yeah. So then somebody finds this, puts it up online, and this is the first time you're finding out that these guys basically stole your design right off from under you. It was like corporate espionage. They made this, this model, your original design, they produced it before you even got a chance to produce it, and they completely butchered it again. Like it was actually, it, it looked like it, they did an okay job making it, but they totally didn't understand what the design was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, from the uh, What You Seek Chinese Mac uh, subforum, uh, for which I did the uh, Seagull ST5. Uh, which was a beautiful uh, project and um, through them I got co uh, connected with the uh, Seagull USA uh, guy uh, I, I believe they, they once did a special edition as well for the watch form so the, he, he was kind of uh, um, a, a known guy in, in um, uh, on the forums this this wasn't the guy in Hong Kong that you and I met when we were hanging out with Hong Kong Ed, his, his friend from Hong Kong Seagull. This is, this is a different arm of Seagull. Yeah. From what I understood later uh, at, at the Hong Kong fair, when I um, confronted uh, Seagull uh, China with uh, two of my designs that they, uh, they, they ripped off, uh, <laughs> Um, that is that the American uh, liaison that they had is was a renegade uh, ex uh, ex uh, employee from Seagull China. So uh, he was basically gone. He'd gone rogue. He was like a buccaneer off the reservation, but he was still making watches with the Seagull logo, and they knew it, and they just they didn't do anything about it. Like they didn't even protect their own trademark right yeah according to them they told us but well, they told you because they were speaking in what, what were they speaking cantonese you were talking to them they must have been speaking cantonese but i remember hong kong ed was there i don't know does he speak mandarin uh no they, they had a sales person from uh, in, in uh, the hong kong uh, from seagull and, and he did the translation to, from cantonese to mandarin all right so our first trip to Hong Kong, the show in mainland China was 2014. This is now 2016, two years later, we're back in Hong Kong at the show. And it's you, me, Hong Kong Ed. Not only did this whole thing with the Bilar go down in like 2014, 2015, whenever that was happening. But by this point, were we at the Hong Kong show when you found out they also copied the Corvid? No, the Corvette was they copied that one. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah, indeed. Um, That's what I remember is that they yeah. already copied the Bilar, and then we were actually mm -hmm. at the show when you found out that they also copied the Corvette. You had a picture of it on your phone, and you, me, and Hong Kong Ed go over to the Seagull booth at the show. Like, we're going to start some trouble. Like, it's going to be like a rumble. Like, we're going to throw down because they stole your design again. So you start I, – I couldn't follow the conversation. It was all in Chinese, but it's you, Hong Kong Ed, the sales guy that also spoke Cantonese, and then he's translating into Mandarin for like the big boss lady that's working the booth, and they're all you're all going back and forth about what happened, who's behind this, and the story is the guy in America, Seagull USA, 
is a renegade ex-employee, but he's still out there making watches with the Seagull logo on there, selling them all over the world, and they're not doing anything about it. In fact, am I crazy or were they actually making the watches for him? Like he was contracting with them to make the watches, even though he was like off the reservation. Do I have that? Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a bit muddy there uh, because the, um, at, at first they didn't admit that they, that the, the watches- They played dumb, they knew nothing about it. They said, no, it's not ours. It wasn't in the booth. Uh, but here's the picture with it, and uh, it's the CEO logo. Saying, I've never seen that. They don't have it in their booth. They don't have it on their website. So no. plausible deniability here says we don't know anything about it. Somebody's making a watch with our logo on it. Because it's certainly, if you understand the Seagull home mothership product line, it's mostly watches they make for the domestic Chinese market. And they're mostly dress watches, kind of fancy, a lot of like complicated mm. stuff. They weren't making anything like the Corvette or the Bellar. That doesn't that doesn't fit into their repertoire. No, but they. <laughs> what was that? Who was that? <laughs> My wife here yeah. uh, walked in. Um, they um, what they yeah they they have the domestic and they have export lines and then they also. Uh, had their overseas, the, the, the U.S. Uh, uh, stuff. But they have this OEM operation where you can basically hire them to build a watch for you, which is why you originally started talking to them and they pushed you to, towards the guy in America. Yeah. So we never really um, got a satisfactory answer out of them. We just had to take their word on it, right? Yeah, well, at, at that time, uh, back when I tried to start uh, a business uh, and hanging around uh, what you seek and seeing uh, all the, the, the seagull uh, stuff and other uh, Chinese uh, Beijing watches and um, which were nice watches. They were well made, good quality watches. Mm -hmm. um, all these project watches came out really well. Yeah. So I. I I thought, well, if they can do this or they, they uh, could do that, uh, I never had them uh, in my hands, but trusting uh, the, the judgment of other uh, members who had handled uh, Seagull watches and, and, and so on. So I gave it a try, um, but it didn't turn out uh, well enough. No, the pictures looked horrible. And again, so, they butchered, absolutely butchered the Bellar, not just the quality, but they didn't understand that the bezel had two rows of numbers on it. One was like a 12 hour, like a poor man's GMT. And then the other one was like a diver bezel, like a 60 minute timer. They actually put one set of those numbers onto the dial, but I think it was a countdown timer. So the numbers were backwards on the dial, right? <sighs> like they, yeah. they messed up the functionality. I think they put the 12 hour scale on the bezel, but they put this, the countdown timer on the dial, but that doesn't work because the numbers are out of order. Do I have that right? Yeah, something like that. Uh, you it, probably it, didn't get what you were doing with the design. No. So, uh, that was the, so that was the original prototype that they butchered. And then they sort of changed the design a little bit this is going back to the Bellar, 2014, 2015. They sold it in Indonesia. And then 2016, we're in Hong Kong, and you find out that they made the, the Corvid, but they changed that design a little bit too. Not much, but it was obviously the Corvid. So they first, they, they first ripped you off and stole the Bellar and made it before you even had a chance to make it. Now they're making the Corvid after you had gone through all the trouble on the Corvid with your first model. I mean, these guys are really taking advantage of the information you had given them in good faith to be your, your, your manufacturing partner potentially. And then mm -hmm. the main Chinese company, Seagull, basically disavowed any knowledge of it and any, act, and any uh, involvement in it. So now, yeah. by this point, were you, I think 2016, had you already started to make the Bellar at that point? I, I, I vaguely recall in 2016, you actually had the updated Bellar design 
prototypes with you at the 2016 show. So you were now making the Bilar, but you had changed the design so it didn't look exactly like the one that they made for Indonesia. Yeah, correct. Um, I updated the design um, because I, I, I wanted to, to show how it can be done or should be done. And um, yeah, after two years uh, in the watch industry, uh, and also found uh, the uh, another better vendor. So things were going uh, the right direction, uh, but then come across uh, what what Seabell does to you, and then yeah, so mind-boggling. But let's bring this current. Even though you had a bunch of problems with the original Aldra, you sold out. And that was 2014, 2015. You sold out of them eventually. Um, and, and it took you longer than it should have, not because there wasn't enough demand, but because you were making sure that every piece you shipped was up to your standards and you had to send them back and forth a few times to get things fixed. So you finally, you finally got done with all that. You sold out. And there's been all these people saying, when are you going to make more Haldras? I want a Haldra. I can't find a Haldra. And as soon as one hits the market, they sell like instantly. I had one. You and I actually, I think, traded. I got a Haldra. You got a Ricardo. And I held on to it for like a year. Loved it. Eventually said, I'm not wearing it enough. I'm going to sell it on. Instantly gone. Full price. So now it's, I guess you, Wow. So you're, you're now bringing back the Holdra now, 2019. It's been almost four or five, or three, three or four years since there's been a Holdra in the world, a new Holdra. So tell us about that. How long has this been in development and what have you been doing with it that it's taken this long to get to it? Do you want to talk about that? Um, Yes, um, be between or after the Holdra, I uh, went to make the uh, Valkyr and um, the Balor. And um, so put the uh, older models uh, to rest for a while and um, started looking for better vendors. And um, that's when the Corvette came, uh, the, the, the automatic Corvette, automatic Corvette, which I love, by the way. I mean, you, I remember you showed me that in 2016, we were hanging out. You showed me the Bilar prototypes and the Corvette prototype. And I was like, this is awesome. Mm. Keep going. Uh, for the Haldra, I, I, this time I, I wanted to, it to be the best I can get. And after uh, talking uh, with my uh, manufacturer and him showing me all kinds of stuff that they uh, made or can do and uh, new materials that they have, um, it, it, it took me a while to combine all the stuff that I uh, would like uh, for the whole drive to have or uh, to use to be a better product. Um, so that's, that's why it, it, it took a couple of years, uh, because I, I, I wasn't sure, uh, where to look for, because there's always a uh, doubt in the back of my mind or with you as well. I think, uh, the grass may be greener at, in, at the other factory. Yeah. I mean, even when you're working with a good factory, there's always some delay or some problem or, you know, Again, people that are not in the business don't get this, but even the best factories, the factory, when we say the factory, they don't actually make anything. They're more like project managers. Every component is made by a specialty vendor. And even if they're working with the best vendors, sometimes they hire a new person or a new team and something doesn't come out right. You can't control every little thing. And it's always in the back of our minds like, I'm tired of this. I want to, I want to get past these problems. I'm going to switch vendors. And that I think is a constant risk in our business is jumping from one vendor to the next and really not seeing any improvement. And you just, you wasted all that time looking around for a new vendor, mm -hmm. trying to work on the process 
to get better product out of the back end of the, of the process. Yeah, yeah. So that's why I um, had the uh, Corvid made first, the automatic Corvid, which is not too complicated to make. And then uh, they made the uh, Balor for me. And both of those came out pretty well. Yeah. Um, so then I, I had the confidence to redo the, the Haldra now. Uh, so what makes it different than the original Haldra? I know you've got different colorways, which by the way, how many colorways do you have on the new Haldra? Five. Five colorways. They all look fantastic. I can't decide which one I like the best. But other than the different colorways, tell us what makes the new Haldra different and better than the old Haldra. Uh, the bezel is... <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's hope so. 300, maybe 500% better. Um, the bezel action or the materials, is there a different design to the bezel? Not just the assembly, but it, the bezel on the new one is flat. The old one was sloped. The old yeah. one was aluminum. The new one is what, steel or ceramic or sapphire? What's the new bezel? Uh, it's enamel. And that, okay. I was hoping you would say this. So this is kind of a new thing. If you go back to vintage watches, there was a material they used to use called Bakelite, which is basically like a form of plastic or kind of like acrylic, where it, it's almost like, an, like a, a, a liquid resin that they do. So the problem with Bakelite is it was very soft, it would chip easily. So now there's this new thing where some really sharp vendors are basically making a bezel, almost like a dish, and they're filling it in with liquid enamel, and that becomes almost like an old school vintage style Bakelite bezel. So you're doing these kind of new school, new Bakelite mm -hmm. enamel bezel bezel inserts on the Holger, which I've seen them. They're amazing. And I've been, I've been waiting to see somebody really start using this. Like the new, um, I forget the model name, but the new Squale basically has that, that enamel bezel and they're gorgeous. Uh, and it has a great warm sort of vintage feel to it. So you're doing enamel, not all the bezel inserts are enamel. Is there one that's like stainless steel? One has a steel insert. Okay, so I have a steel insert, but the others are enamel. So that's cool. And obviously, the construction is much better, much more secure, better feel, better sound, better, no, no slop, no bounce. Well, there, there's also one uh, um, pro uh, for enamel uh, inserts or bezels uh, compared to sapphire, uh, which they uh, can also do uh, transparent uh, or the, uh, sapphire um inserts they are printed on the under uh, un, uh, on beneath the, the sapphire and then inserted into the bezel with enamel bezels they can print the uh, the loom inside the bezel which can be made thicker the loom can be made thicker. Yeah. So and it's the, almost, like, almost like a sandwich construction. Yeah, and, and, and then the enamel is poured in, cured, and then uh, um, uh, sanded smooth. So practically, uh, you can have more loom yeah. or as, as much as you want in uh, on the bezel and then uh, pour the enamel uh, over it. Which, uh, if you if you compare it to sapphire bezels, they can only print thin, right on the on the side of the bezel, and then is because if they uh, the printing went thicker, then you would have air and other pockets and uh, and right. So yeah. this is something I've talked about with uh, the guys that are into what I do, and, and say why don't you use ceramic bezel inserts or, or sapphire inserts and what I try to get people to understand is there's no perfect material. Each material has its pros and cons. And in sapphire, while it may be the hardest and most difficult to scratch, the disadvantage, first off, I don't even like the way sapphire bezel inserts look personally. But if you were going to make one, people have to understand that the sapphire is actually transparent. All the markings in the loom, like you said, are on the bottom. 
they're printed on the bottom and then sapphire laid in on top you can't like you're saying you can't make that loom application too thick because even you know microns matter in watchmaking if you have a thicker application then you get air underneath and even with a thin application if you get any salt water or chlorine water that gets underneath that bezel insert then you get what's called delamination which is the water and the the, the salt or the chemicals of the cool water start to basically rot away at the markings under the bezel and that isn't something mm -hmm. you can easily fix like a, an aluminum or a metal or even a ceramic bezel insert you can take the whole thing out and just replace it with sapphire inserts there's no there's nothing to take out the entire bezel assembly has to be replaced not just the part with the markings on it but the actual steel underlying ring that has all the click mechanism that whole part needs to come off the case and a new one brought back down on it so right. it's very much more complicated job to replace that. Whereas with enamel, they can basically lay in a little bit of the enamel like resin, let it cure and dry, then put the loom on it and all the markings. They can do it really thick and bright. They can make a full loom bezel, which is amazing. They can use metal inserts to kind of do kind of cool things with the bezel markings. And then they layer more resin on top. The whole thing cures, it becomes like a solid layer. Everything's inside. It doesn't matter if water gets underneath. There's nothing that's going to go wrong because of that. So, yeah. and, it, and, it, and it's, again, like sapphire, it can't be scratched, but if it falls, you could chip it or shatter it. The, the uh, resin or the enamel bezel, it's softer. It can be sort of scratched, but it doesn't shatter or break. No, so, but in, yeah, you, you can polish it uh, if it gets... Uh, yeah, it's like an acrylic scratch. crystal. You can polish it down. You can polish scratches out of it. So I love that you're doing that. So better bezel mechanism, better um, uh, bezel insert sort of design, all new colorways. Is there anything else? I mean, is the case design basically the same, but for the different bezel? Uh, the case is also a little bit changed to adapt to the, the flatter uh, or the flat bezel. Uh, bezel is uh, it's a little bit thicker flat and the case is uh, le uh, has a less dramatic curve with two otherwise the, the contrast between the flat bezel and, and the case would be too dramatic so all right yeah. so still looks a little like the old holdra but for those of us that do case design we understand it's a completely different case yeah e every line had to be redrawn had to be re-engineered inside um, movement is what? Miyota STP? What are you putting in there? Uh, Miyota 9015. Okay. And you originally, all your models were no date only, but now you're offering date or no date as an option. Yeah, because uh, <laughs> so the first uh, 300 uh, Huldras, uh, none of them had a date, but uh, I had customers or wannabe customers is it, uh, if it only had a date, uh, then I would buy it instantly. So, I said, okay. But you never offered a date because you're just like, you're insane as a designer. Like you are just an artist through and through and you just felt like a date threw off the balance of the dial and you just wouldn't have it, right? I mean, is that, that's basically what, what it was. Yeah. <laughs> so for, for this, uh, I, 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 I drew a, a date window at six and then a uh, trapezium uh, size or, or shape. shape. And, but the, uh, the font had to be changed to fit the, uh, the aperture. So are you reprinting the date wheels? Yeah. And what about the no dates? Are they, do they have the ghost date change position on the crown or do they not have it? Um, that one I will be using the 90 S5. So it'll be a 9015 in the with date version, obviously because it has the date change, and then the no date has the 90 S5, which is a true no date version of the 9015. Yes. So there won't be any ghost date change position, phantom date change position on the crown, which no. 
That's like the new thing that annoys watch geeks is, is the fan. Yeah, but, but the, 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 the 90S5 actually is in the open heart um, uh, movement. Yeah. But you, you won't see that, uh, but it, it does not have a date. So that uh, it's exactly the same height uh, and stack height for the, for the handset as the 9015. Right. Because you also have the 9039. 9039, and that has a different, yeah. We're deep in the weeds here, but I'll, I'll, I'll make this quicker. The 9015 is the standard movement has a date window, has a date change position on, this, on the, the crown. Um, if you want the no date, they came out with this model years ago, the 9 OS 5, which is an open heart version and also no date. But for years, it was a lot more expensive than the 9015 and they didn't make as many. They didn't make them all the time, so they were harder to get. Then, like last year or the year before, Miyota came out with a different version, the 939, which is basically a no date version of the 9015, doesn't have the open heart, and was actually less expensive than the 9 OS 5, but they screwed us all over by making the hands post height different. So you actually have to make the hands, the hands are like this, but there's like a little part underneath that's like a sleeve that goes over the hands post. You have to make the hands different and it becomes a nightmare in assembly if you try to make a model with date 9015, no date 939. So, now what's happening is more of us are starting to use the 9 OS 5 because the prices have come down. But for years, like we just didn't have a choice. If you wanted to use the 9015, there wasn't a 9039 and the 9 OS 5 was like prohibitively expensive. But we're better, we're, the industry is kind of caught up to what micro brands need in terms of these movements. Hmm. So you're using the 9 OS 5 with no dates. Probably will use the 9039 at some point because uh, you can make uh, thinner. a watch thinner. Right. So we're using, so we're doing uh, the NTH subs again, and we we're using all three. So if there's a model that comes with or without a date, we're using the 9015 or the 9 OS 5. If it's a model that is strictly no date only, we're using the 90, 9039. And it, it just there, it doesn't need an explanation, but there's. There is an explanation why we're bothering to get all three instead of just sticking with the 9 OS 5. Um, so where are you with the Holger right now? Is it ready for delivery, in production, you're in pre-order? Wh where are you? Um, it's in uh, pre-order, uh, but the production go-ahead has been given. Um, so hopefully uh, it will all be... Uh, ready for release uh, by the end of November. And maybe if I'm lucky, early November. All right, so I'm on your website here. I'm just trying to, you got everything in euros. Um, restore pages now. Um, so it's, uh, what is it without the VAT? Uh, current uh, pre-order pricing is without the fat is 371 euros. It's about $380. Hold on. So 371 euros in pre-order. That's for people that don't live in Europe, don't have to pay the VAT. Shit, I just, mm -hmm. I just clicked on the little box that said, go away. I don't want to change currency. I could have just automatically converted this into dollars. But all right, so you're at, Three, how much? 371 euro? Mm -hmm. All right, so I'm just doing the calculation here online. That's $416 okay. US, which for, for a watch with these specs, I mean, it's Miyota Movement, fantastic design. It's got, what, is it 200 or 300 meter water resistance? 200. 200. Um, gorgeous design, well made. You improve the bracelet, I know. You know, the, the bracelet on the first model was fine, but, you know, the finishing wasn't perfect. I know it's going to be a fantastic watch for, and, and the, the final price is going to be 449 including the VAT, estimated release, and then, oh, upon release, it's going to be 650 euro, which is 729 United States dollars, but that's including the VAT. So it's going to be, going to be like 20% less than that. So it'll be about $600 U.S., not including the VAT, which people outside of, of Europe don't have to pay for. What you're offering, 
This is fantastic. So how long has it been in pre-order now? Um, three weeks, something like that. And it's already in production. So when is it due for delivery? November, sometime in November. Uh, End of November you got. Okay, so right now we're having this conversation. It's middle of July. By the time this gets up on the web, it'll be probably closer to late July. So from late July to late November, four months is all people have to wait to get this watch, but they can still get it at pretty nice discount to the ultimate retail price. And I don't know how many you're making, but it looks like you've already blown through about half of the pieces that you're making in pre-orders. So it's not like you've got unlimited inventory. You know, the numbers have been set. You're only making as many as you're making. When they're gone, they're gone until you make another batch and who knows when that'll be. Are you making the same number of each version, each colorway? No, I, I've looked at the uh, pre-orders um, and decided uh, that they, some colors or combinations uh, have more pre-orders than others. So I, I made a decision and uh, about 600 in total. And You're making 600 watches in total? Yeah. Okay. And that, that green is just phenomenal. Yeah, the, the teal, blue, uh, and, and green, those are the, the front runners. And then uh, the other colors are uh, e equal. I'm, look yeah. I'm looking at a blue. The bezel looks black. Is the bezel black or is it dark blue? Or is there another one that has a blue bezel? It's a black bezel. So it's blue and black, green and green, orange and steel. What colorway am I missing here? Is there a black and black? Is that... Okay, I'm looking at the black and black, right? So those are the five colorways. So it's and, and and teal. Okay. Green on green, green dial, green bezel, orange dial, steel bezel, black dial, black bezel, blue dial, black bezel. Is that blue is also teal, or is there another one that I'm not oh, seeing? It's, uh, the, the, those two are different. Yeah. The, so there's two the, different blues. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. So ah. Uh, that teal blue, that is awesome. Yeah. That, and that's kind of the color that I had, the original. Is that the same sort of Pantone it's color? Same as blue, but this time it's not a uh, metallic. It's a matte. Like a matte, matte yeah. finish. I kind of like the metallic finish. It was like a metal flake, like from the 70s, you know, paint jobs on bands. Yeah, okay. yeah but that wouldn't work with the uh, enamel. Uh, no, I, I get what you're doing there, but I, it's just, I loved it then. I still love it now. I, I understand how the, you know, the, the improvements you've made forced you to change some of the things about the design. I think they're all improvements and changes for the better. This is just a phenomenal looking watch. Oh, these are just gorgeous pictures on your website. And, and by the way, you do all the picture photography yourself, right? Yeah. Yeah. So. And the, and the website uh, also. You, yeah, you're, you are, like I said many times, you are the, in my, in my opinion, you are the most talented natural designer working in this industry today. You just, I think you could make anything. You could make furniture, you could make shoes, whatever you make, you just have a natural eye for detail and everything you make is just sort of so crisp and perfect and balanced in every way. And again, you, you do photography, I've seen, you know, you're, you look like a fashion model when we go out in Hong Kong, the way you dress. I mean, you really, you, you know, you're the complete package. So, you know, if people that want it should go to avig.com, look under watches for the Huldra. It's still available in pre-order. You got four months to get it. Um, do you want to talk about something you're working on next? Do you want to kind of give us a preview of where your head is for the future? What, what do you want to do after this? Are you going to do more of the Bilar, the Valkyr, do you have other stuff you want to do that's completely different? Um, the idea is, is to do uh, a watch in every category that I know or want to do. So uh, there is still a, a chronograph uh, somewhere in the pipeline. And, uh, but I think the next new model would be a GMT. Um, so I'm working on that. 
that's going to excite a lot of people. People ask me to make a GMT all the time. I don't want to do it. So that's going to be cool to do a, yeah. do a GMT. Yeah. So, yeah. I, still a, a vintage uh, a vibe to it, but different. And then also the other thing is that uh, I will keep bringing back uh, older models. So, uh, so next up for that is the, the Valkyr will come back. And uh, a lot of people want to have the bronze. Yeah, that bronze was pretty cool. So a, a watch in every category. Obviously, you've got a diver. The Corvid is basically a field watch, right? Mm -hmm. What is the Valkyr? I mean, is it like sports, sports watch? Kind of racing inspired sports watch has kind of that vintage 70s sort of racing feel to it. Um, GMT, chronograph. Are you going to make like a pilot watch? Uh, I had designs for that, a, but I don't know. It's it's um, pilot chronographs. Pilot chronograph, maybe. Yeah, but okay. I'm All right, well, I don't want to put you on the spot too much. Go back a little bit when you and me and Sue Jane were online every night, almost every night talking. I remember there was a conversation we had <clears throat> where you said, hey guys, I'm, I'm thinking about making a diver, another diver, in addition to the Holdra, this is like my next diver. What do you think? And you showed it to us and I looked at it and I was like, I, I feel terrible telling you this, but I'm making this diver called the Orthos and it kind of has some design similarities between what, you know, the orthos and what you're doing. And quite honestly, I don't mind saying this publicly and right to your face, like the reason the orthos had some similarities to your design was I was starting to pick up little design cues from what you were doing with previous designs, things that, you know, the crosshairs of the Flying Dutchman project we did for the Affordable Watches subforum. I'd seen you kind of use that as a, a design cue in other illustrations you had done for the Chinese mech watch sub forum projects. Um, you know, I, I started to figure out that I really liked the pattern of straight indices that intersect with concentric, concentric uh, circular patterns on the dial that can kind of almost like a, like a target or uh, crosshairs. I kind of like that aesthetic that I've seen you do before with like the Velar. Um, so I, I tell you like, I'm already working on this, it's already in prototyping, I never showed you guys. And you, you kind of just put that whole design away and you haven't shown it to anybody, at least as far as I know, since then. But I really liked it. Have you thought about picking that up again and maybe making it the way it was or, or changing it and making another diver in addition to the Holdra? Because I thought it was a great design, but for the fact that I was making something that kind of looked like it at the same time. Um, yeah. You, you remember what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I've tried to go back and find it to, to look at it again. Like, and for the life of me, I cannot find that message with those images you had attached. Yeah, it, uh, that one now evolved into the, the GMT. That's going to be the GMT? Okay. So for people that like GMTs and love your design sensibilities, which everybody should, this is going to be amazing because... I always thought that was a great design. I thought that, but for the fact that we would have been making something very similar at the same time, it, it was a design that deserved life to make that as a GMT. And I know you're not gonna make it exactly the way it was, you're gonna change it, but hopefully at least I'll recognize some of the things, some of the design cues. That's gonna be amazing. Yeah, the, the one thing uh, I also had uh, in mind was um, very much like the, your bracelet on the devil ray. Um, and I showed that to my manufacturer and, and he said, no, that, that can't be done because the, the, the middle link is, uh, anyway. the links are angled. Yeah. How can that not be done? Because I have a drawing here and you put pins there and there and it's all straight. And so it, it, it looks uh, angle, but it still works. Yeah. Uh, can be done. Okay, so I let that... Uh, to be honest, we weren't high. sure. When we were working on it, we weren't sure it could be done either. But 
it helps to have somebody on my design team, my guy Rusty, who has the ability to do 3D modeling. And so he could actually position the pivot pin inside the link where we needed it and make sure that he, he could model it all in real time and move the parts and make sure that they all moved independently. It wasn't, the Devil Ray bracelet came out well overall, but because of the design and how complicated it is, it has kind of a higher defect rate. And defects with bracelets are almost unheard of. The bracelet either works or it doesn't. It either, you know, it, you don't, what's a defect with a bracelet? It falls apart. Well, we actually had a couple links on a few people's bracelets where the link actually just completely blows, you know, explodes. Um, not literally, you know, explosive, but the, because of the construction and the location of that pin and how it all comes together, so, you know, the, the pins are basically friction fed. So, it, you know, almost like yeah. the, the and because of the, the angle in it and uh, if you bend it by wearing it and, and then it, it will wedge. Uh, the pin isn't bent, the pin is straight, but I, mm -hmm. I don't know exactly why it's happening, but I think what it is is that the, um, the location of the pin is moved inward from this, you know, like most links, they come together like this, they pivot right there, and the pin is like right here, and ours is kind of down here because, you know, this surface here is, is angled, is sloped. Yeah. So the pin has to be farther down, and I guess that maybe puts stress on the joint, and it hasn't happened a lot. We had a handful of people report, uh, you know, my bracelet kind of fell apart, and we just replaced the link. But, you know, it wasn't an easy thing to do, and I, I can understand if a vendor goes, we're not even touching that. Yeah. So yeah, it was. I I was surprised then uh, to see it. It it can be done. It kind I of see it right here. It's my my idea was very similar. And after I, all the ideas I've stolen from you, I mean flat out stolen. I not not designs, but like different things that I saw you do, and I go, oh, I really like that. I'm going to do something like that. It's, it's, it warms my heart to know that you're finally coming back and stealing an idea from me. Yeah, we'll, we'll work on that, yeah. It's, it's all good, all fair and love and war. All right, so for the future, you're planning a GMT. You're still looking at a chrono, but that's kind of sometime in the future, we're not sure when, and then maybe a pilot watch slash chrono. Yeah, maybe, but uh, also a another not a, exactly a dress watch because I have that, uh, uh, but a an, a another a sporty thin watch would. Uh, That's not the Valkyrie. Something else besides the Valkyrie. Yeah. Okay, so more more dressy sports watch, but then uh, using the nineteen thirty nine. Uh, okay. Well, we didn't get to, we kind of did your origin story. You've been on the forum since 20, 2007. And, you know, did, did, did you, was there something from your childhood, uh, you know, grandfather pocket watch? You know, do you want to do that real quick? What, what, what got you into watches? Are we just always into? Uh, I think I, I always had a, a watch since I was uh, eight, eight years old, I think. Um, and then between 12 and 16, uh, broke a couple and then maybe didn't wear a watch for a year. And that, uh, and how I actually got into collecting watches is when I was 16, I think, uh, I was on vacation in, um, in Hong Kong, uh, meeting my family there but in the plane I met a girl and she collected um, swatch uh, the plastic swatch uh, yeah from the 80s yeah this was we 16 it was the 80s yeah and 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 and, and uh, those were cool so in Hong Kong I I, I bought one and then uh, back in the Netherlands uh, I started collecting uh, some swatches and then from there, that led to vintage Seikos and 
Yeah, but yeah, you know, then the the, the swatch uh, watches would, would would break, and then I didn't wear a watch for a long time, and then uh, when I w got to find a watch you seek was because I I bought a vintage uh, Zodiac at a flea market. And I didn't know anything about it. it, it I only knew it looked cool. It had that mystery uh, dial. And uh, uh, you found a vintage mystery dial at a flea market? Yeah, for I think in dollars now for I think uh, it was I paid forty dollars. That's amazing. I mean, that's really like a barn find. That's like finding some old, you know, fabulous car in somebody's barn, finding a, a, a vintage Zodiac mystery dial at a flea market. That's phenomenal. Yeah. So, and, and then I, I went researching uh, that on uh, what you seek and- Next, next thing you know, you're making watches. And then I, I saw, whoa, there are tons of other uh, vintage stuff out there. And then I went on a shopping spree on eBay and I collected a, 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 lo a lot of, uh, bad watches as well they, they look good on in pictures and then you uh, get them and everything falls apart or it's far smaller in size than it actually i, I thought it was so uh, yeah all right so i don't think i'm going to hong kong this year we usually go every even numbered year so we went 2014 2016 2018 2019 i'm not going are you going to hong kong this year Maybe, uh, still has to find a, an additional strap for the Haldra, I think. I, 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 I want to have a uh, rubber strap to go with it. Well, let's talk about that offline because I have a good vendor for that. Okay, cool. Um, and I have to, uh, I, I need to speak to my uh, vendor or manufacturer about the GMT stuff that I want to make. So uh, yeah. you're thinking about a Swiss movement probably with the GMT. Yeah. And I mean, how close are you to, to working on the chrono? Have you started looking at movements for the chrono? Are you thinking mecha quartz or automatic or please don't say Chinese mechanical? But, no, 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 no. Um, well, it's, there is Seiko, the ZK uh, quartz, uh, mecha, mecha quartz, quartz. Uh, series. And their NE88. Um, the automatic. Automatic uh, chronograph. So you're going to do like what some guys do where they basically make one case that fits both and they offer it as either a mechanical automatic with the Seiko NE88 or Mecha Quartz with the Seiko BK whatever? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. But um, I think I need to get me, uh, get myself a uh, NE88 powered watch first to see how it operates and uh, have my uh, watchmaker look at it and then decide because it's it's quite pricey and uh, yeah well but i mean what other choices do we have at this point because well you could go swiss but then it well, will become even more expensive it becomes even more expensive and you know what are your choices you have two different calibers from eta you got the value or the uh, whatever the number is from ETA, and are they even selling them anymore? Or do you get it from Salida, and what's the quality going to be? Or do you go with like Eterno or Sopra? I don't, I don't even know if Sopra has a chrono, but it starts to get really expensive, and then you get into reliability issues, and there are certain things with those older Swiss movements, like the Valju, they, they, they have like little quirks to them, like the crown is kind of wonky sometimes, and the reset doesn't always work right, and, you know, you get a lot, you got a higher number of customer complaints or support requests. So it's a, you gotta be careful to want a chronograph. And, and I totally get, like, you want to get one, make sure the movement works, you know, road test it. You road test somebody else's model first before you commit to it. Yeah. All right. So this has been a long time overdue. Thank you for joining us. I want to urge everyone watching to get to avig.com check out the watches from Chip. I'll say it again, best designer in the game, phenomenal watches. Everybody that I, that I, I see talking about the Holdra online is excited that it's finally back and better than before. Um, but 
there's other there's other I mean you still have stock on some of the other models you still have the Velar you still have the Corvette and the Valkyr and you still got the Thor I mean we didn't even talk about the Thor that thing is amazing the linen dial we didn't even get to that we can't get to it but Everybody should go to avig.com, check out the Thor dress watch, the Valkyr, the Corvid, the Velar, the New Huldra. They're all fantastic designs, all original, vintage inspiration, but nothing really that you would call an homage to anything. Just real crisp, sharp designs, all well-made, backed up by Chip and his amazing service. Survived all these calamities early on in his business. I don't know what else to say about your, you and your business. I'm a big fan, obviously. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Chip Yuan from AVIG. Check out his website, avig.com.